know, you can generally round out a dinner party extremely well and be assured of a pretty good conversation when you bring together a multiple Emmy Award winning chief medical correspondent, a practicing neurosurgeon, a New York Times best-selling nonfiction writer, an individual who's been offered the job of the Surgeon General and decided to turn it down, and a novelist whose book is about to become a TV series. Unless, of course, you've invited Dr. Sanjay Gupta, in which case you have only filled one chair. We regularly welcome Sanjay Gupta into our homes, um, and tonight we have the great joy of welcoming him to our stage. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Sanjay Gupta. Thank you. Appreciate welcome. It. Appreciate it. Welcome, you. welcome, 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 welcome. So set the bar kind of high there. <laughs> <laughs> so the the story centers around a meeting called the Mortality and Morbidity meeting, or Morbidity and Mortality. Right. And I actually had trouble. First of all, understanding the difference between those two words, even when I look them up. You know, we talk about morbidity rates, yeah. which are kind of death rates and mortality. What, what is the difference between the words? And then we'll share with the audience, for those who haven't read it, what that kind of meeting is. Sure. Uh, you know, I think, I think from a medical standpoint, and some of this, you're right, the definitions are, are uh, they probably cross over a little bit. But typically, we talk about death with regard to mortality. And morbidity is more complications. Mm -hmm. So not necessarily death, but things that have, that have happened that have either come about as a result of error or just some unexpected outcome, but in either case, uh, a patient uh, had, you know, was harmed in some way. So that, that's typically the And that's what goes on. So, so the book actually sort of centers around and, and, and jumps off in various points from that meeting. Is that a real thing? Like, does it happen? That's Do hospitals thing. have them? It's a, it's a real thing. So share, share with everybody what... When, when, when in most hospitals, certainly all teaching hospitals, but most hospitals uh, really, um, you know, anywhere in the world, if a mistake occurs or there's some un unexpected outcome, doctors will get together. And it's, it's a closed door meeting. It's not supposed to take the place of you know, the punitive process, uh, uh, the legal process or anything like that. But this is doctors holding each other accountable for a mistake that has occurred. And basically saying, look, a mistake happened here. Uh, you messed up. And, and most importantly, here's how not to make that mistake again. And everyone else in the room who's listening to it in this particular meeting can also learn from it. And it, as unsettling as it is to think about, um, the practice of medicine does move forward in many ways because uh, of, of what, what would be best referred to as trial and error. People, people try things, they don't always work, the mistakes happen, and the worst crime of all would be not learning from those mistakes. So this was about this pretty secretive meeting. And what I was sort of stunned by is that most people certainly outside the, the medical world, don't know that a meeting like this even exists. How, how's that actually, you know, I, I personally served uh, on an executive capacity in a hospital here right. for 20 years, and I am pretty engaged. I, I imagine, because they're an operating hospital, they have this. Yeah. How come, no, it, it's surprising, how come this doesn't get out? Like, well, this it, is, it sort of would be interesting, right? People would want to know what goes on in those meetings. Yeah. And, I think, I think that in part that's by design, Heather. I think, you know, they, 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 there was always this idea that, you know, this is going to be one of the hallowed areas of medicine where, um, you know, we don't want to violate that, that hallowed area. Uh, but I think you're right in the sense that, that just that the people know that a meeting like this even happens. I think when a mistake happens in a hospital, um, right away there is a barrier that is set up often between patient and doctor. And sometimes, to be candid, it's perfectly appropriate. Maybe something you know, has, has happened and, and uh, you know, that, that barrier is appropriate. But in other cases, it's, it's not. You know, the, the relationship between doctor and patient can actually be improved if they know that a discussion has happened around this, uh, people have you know, weighed in on it, and some learning has happened. I think you, you find that's what patients often want more than anything else. In the book, your main character, Ty, wrestles, he, he has a patient die on the table, and clearly it's affected him hugely, and he wrestles with it, including wanting to go and apologize to the parents. Do doctors, I mean, I, I, I just don't know the circumstances, do, do doctors do that? Do they ever, you know, they lose a patient and they say, listen, I actually made a mistake? Does, it, does that well, ever happen? It, it does, and, and I think it's happening more in certain situations. I mean. What, what, is, what has dictated this in so many ways, as in other parts of our society, is, is the legal system. And, mm -hmm. what, and what I was, you know, with Ty's story in particular, I really wanted to, to highlight the, you know, a lot of the reporting and, and studies that I've done over the years 
looking at what is it that really, you know, what do people really want to come out of something like this? And what you find is that, you know, an acknowledgement of someone's grief over an error that has occurred really ends up being at the top of the list. And what infuriates uh, patients... Someone's own ability. That's right. To deal with their mistake. Right, and, and to ha but to also have the doctor right. acknowledge it. Right, that's say, what I mean. Yeah. Right. And, and I, oh, and I okay. think that... Uh, w what happens a lot of times, you know, for very for lots of different reasons, is is almost the opposite, where you know uh, there there is no discussion of it uh, any further. Uh, certainly, the words "I'm sorry" are never mm -hmm. uh, uttered, and and I, you know, I it's a novel, but I think I was making a point. You know, there was a campaign that I had read about years ago. It was called the Sorry Works campaign, and basically, it was a campaign to try and. Uh, you know, uh, nurture the relationship between doctors and patients and healthcare professionals and patients, you know, nurses and patients in all sorts of different situations, including a situation where an error has occurred. And I thought it was really fascinating. And I also thought on a personal level for Ty, you know, what, is, what does redemption really mean? He was forgiven by the parents of this child. Mm -hmm. And that was almost so hard for him to believe that someone could just forgive him so easily because he himself was not the forgiving type that it took, you know, took the relationship in a whole different direction. And you, you raise in this, I mean, the, the story is just, it, it is a fast-paced, compelling story. Five surgeons, your fantastic character, your ER character, who's a fantastic <laughs> character. Thank you. Um, and the, the various situations that each face, um, that each faces in the story. What, so what, what drove you to write this book? And, you know, in, inevitably, there must be characters in here that, you came across in your <laughs> medical school days. It's, it's interesting for us to know what goes on. Like, how did this story happen? You know, I, uh, these meetings, uh, for 20 years I've been attending these meetings, and they've been some of the most indelible experiences I've ever had. I would take notes at the meetings because I wanted to learn. Uh, so I'd write down what happened and, uh, and write down what the solutions were. And, you know, over the years I started looking at these notes. I think after I became a reporter, I, I looked at these notes and, and saw there was some amazing stories in there, some amazing... Um, um, characters uh, sort of populating those stories. And I thought, first I thought maybe this should be something that I write about in a non-fiction way, you know, just to sort of expose a little bit of this, this, um, this amazing world of medicine, uh, this amazing part of it, to readers. Um, but I wanted a little bit more leeway. And it wasn't about implicating anybody in particular or implicating particular hospitals. I just wanted to tell the story and give people sort of this peek behind the curtain. So that was, what, that was sort of the interesting um, part for me. But I think there was a particular event um, which really made me uh, want to write about this. And I, and I remember once I was in one of these meetings, and there was one of my favorite attendings. Uh, you know, he was this guy who was just this great surgeon. I used to love to operate with him because he was just so good. He was one of these guys who just never wasted any movements and, and everything was just always beautiful when, when you're in the operating room with him, the type of music that he listened to. He was just, he was one of these guys and I really emulated him, but I realized I knew nothing about him. I didn't know this man at all. Um, I didn't know his personal story. And, you know, a lot of times that's just the way it is. You just don't know your mentors uh, on a personal level. And we were in one of these meetings, Heather, and, and, a, uh, somebody was presenting uh, the story of this case that uh, was frankly, it was just reckless what had happened. And it made all of us sort of our, you know, it kind of gave you a little pit in your stomach. And, you know, I'm, I'm the kind of person who, when, that, when I hear, I'm hearing something like that, uh, I think of my own, my own parents uh, potentially as having been the patients in that situation yeah. or my own family members or people that I love. And it makes you, it, re it really gets to you. It makes your skin crawl to a certain extent. And I remember at some point, uh, you know, our chairman basically, you know, said, look, you know, it was a terrible error, and this and you're gonna, we're going to suspend your privileges for a couple of weeks, essentially. And it just seemed like not to fit mm -hmm. with the what... The couple of weeks being so little. Yeah, so little, not to fit with what, what he had just talked about. And so, so my favorite attendant, this guy who, got, who, who, who I didn't know personally, got up, and, and he was the kind of person who would never sort of speak while sitting down. He would speak while standing mm -hmm. up, and he was, you know, just raise himself to his full posture. And he, he came to realize that at some point he had um, learned a lot about this patient who had passed away. He knew everything about her. He knew the names of her kids. He knew mm -hmm. the names of her parents. He knew what she liked to do. And he basically just started telling the entire room of surgeons the story of this woman. Uh, and it was this incredible reminder. First of all, it taught me a lot about him. Mm -hmm. Just the person that he was that in his spare time, a patient that wasn't even his, that he had no direct responsibility for, he wanted to know everything about this woman. 
And then he wanted everyone in the room to be reminded about what we do and why it's so important and not just to like give initials and numbers and make it so It's not a body on a bed. It's not a body on a bed or... And, and um, I think that was the moment that, that I thought, you know, I want, to, I want to show people some of this as well. I, I think this is a part of medicine that very few people get to see. I learned a lot there, and I thought maybe I could teach as well. Sure. Yeah. So. Who's your favorite character in the book? <laughs> Um, Not the one you're most like. I, I read about who you thought you were most like. Who's your favorite character? I think, I think, Unless uh, it's the best. I think Villanueva oh, yeah. is my favorite character. He's, a, um, he's the ER surgeon. He's an ER surgeon, trauma surgeon. He, he uh, is a former uh, linebacker, professional football player. Overweight. Uh, he, he, you know, he, he let himself go after he left the NFL. And he, is, uh, he's th- he can't find scrubs that fit him. He's just so big. So, knows, so he's always wearing like a very large white jacket as a result to sort of cover things up. Uh, and he is insatiable in all ways. He just, he's got this booming personality, and he like, loves to just show off in front of the ER. But he's also, uh, people listen to him because he's usually right, as much as other people would not like to admit it. The thing about Villanueva, got, he's, they call him the fat cat, El, you know, El Gato. <laughs> and uh, and he's, he's, this, he's this amazing guy. But the thing that I think I love about him the most is that despite the fact that there's no soft edges around him, is that he's the purest of all the characters. Compassionate. Always, yeah, he's compassionate. You know how he's going to behave uh, in just about any situation. And he always does the right thing. There's no secondary gain issues with him. He's just going to call it the way he sees it, and, and, his, and the patient's interests are always the first and foremost in his mind. Right. So, I, so, yeah. so, so, now, um, so now it's going to be made into a television series, right. which is incredible. And yeah. if this was a theatrical production, or even as a television series, and you could cast anybody you wanted, no, <laughs> no concerns about the cost of the characters, and I think this will make them come alive for people in the audience who haven't yet read the book, who are you casting in these parts? Well, you know, so I have to preface by saying we've already like, shot the pilot. If Orson Welles was alive, he could be Villanueva. <laughs> he could be Villanueva, yes. Right? That's what, <laughs> you know, so we have a, we have a Villanueva, who I think is, is, is great. Uh, Ving Rhames is actually okay, playing. He's, uh, he's a, Ving Rhames is a... Um, He's a feature film actor primarily. He does uh, he's Mission Impossible movies with okay. Tom Cruise. But he's, he's our Villanueva, and okay. it's funny because we, we, we read a lot of people for that part, and, he's, and he just... So are you, uh, are you part of the casting? I'm, well, yeah, kind of. You know, I, it's funny because you know, you'll appreciate this as someone who loves books, but you know, the characters in here are like my children. You know, I can feel it. Can't you feel it I just mean, listening to him speak? I love these characters. I can tell you their favorite right. sock color. You know, yeah. I mean, I know everything hey, about them. Hey, what socks are you wearing today? You're famous for your socks. Yeah, I like, I like socks. You know, it's yeah. like one of the few expressions of our individuality <laughs> anymore. You know? In an increasingly conformist You're society, for you your wear socks. crazy socks. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I really feel like the characters are, are you know, uh, I know them so well. You know, and, and I had no intention for this to be a television series, so da- David E. Kelly, who's the television writer, had called me and said he was interested in this. <coughs> but, you know, I think when you're reading a book, there's some great advantages to just reading a book, and that is that your imagination fills in a lot of gaps. Like, you have no idea, like, you know, your, your Villanueva, my right. Villanueva could be two completely different people, but that's great that right. you have that. When you do a TV series, now I'm filling in a lot more of the, the, right. the detail for you. Sanjay, thank you, thank you. so much. Appreciate just a it. pleasure to have you. Oh, just it's an honor to be here. Thank just, you. Just, just phenomenal. Just, just phenomenal. <laughs>